Camp CC! Welcome! I'm Cherise Bennett and I'm a middle school leader and I serve on the hospitality team. If you are new here with us today or just checking us out, would you let us know? We want to connect with you. We have some gifts for you. You can stop by the welcome counter in the lobby on the left hand side or go to camcc.net and click on next steps. If it is your first time, we have a $5 Starbucks gift card to enjoy a coffee on us. And we'll also make a $5 donation to the charity you select. If it's your second time, we will mail you a thirst quenching mug for your favorite beverage. If it's your third time, we'll put you on an invitation list for our guest dessert. This is a chance to get to know some of our pastors and elders and for them to get a chance to know you. We are so glad you're joining us. Know you are loved and cared for here at Camp CC. If you have any prayer requests, would you please let us know? We want to be praying for you and with you. Go to campcc.net, click on next steps, or email michelle at campcc.net. I also want to tell you about some exciting things coming up at Camarillo Community Church. So get out your phones and mark your calendars. For the month of November, the Hope Project, you are not alone. Our next community impact initiative will be partnering with Ventura County Pregnancy Center. During the month, we want to encourage you to pray for the center to find a doctor that can read and give results for the ultrasounds to the parents. There is also four other ways to be involved. One, you can buy a onesie or as many as you want and place them in the crib that'll be in the church lobby. Secondly, you can donate money to help with buying pregnancy tests. For every $40 that is donated, the Pregnancy Center will be able to buy 10 tests. Thirdly, you can donate money to help the center buy Bibles. For every $30 that is donated, the Pregnancy Center will be able to buy 10 Bibles. Lastly, buy a new infant car seat. Bring it to the church lobby. For more information or questions on how to donate, please contact Genesis at campcc.net. Saturday, December 5th, Christmas movie night. Come ring in the holiday season. We will watch a Christmas movie. There will be movie theater snacks and hot chocolate. Also, we'll be doing our first annual church lighting ceremony. You do not want to miss out on the fun night for the whole family. For more information, go to campcc.net backslash upcoming events. Camp CC Custom Maps. We have some Camp CC swag. There are four unique designs and we have very limited amount left. The masks are adjustable and super soft. All masks are available while supplies last. To check out these cool designs or to check out the deals, go to campcc.net or contact Michelle at campcc.net. Volunteers, we have some amazing opportunities to serve here at Camp CC. If you'd like to get involved in an area you are passionate about, or if you would like to know the current need of the church, you can contact Genesis at campcc.net for more information. To stay in the loop of what's going on at Camp CC, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information on any of these events, go to campcc.net. Good morning, Camarillo Community Church. So glad you can be with us here today, whether you're here in person, out on the patio, or online. We're just glad you're here with us. My name is Kenny Kibble. I'm the executive pastor. We've got a great morning planned for you. We're going to continue our series called Countercultural, where Pastor Dave is going to be speaking today. Just to, uh, as a way of letting you know that content is a little bit more adult in nature than uh, normal. So if you're watching with your kids, you may want to make a decision uh, about that. Uh, but right now, let's stand and worship our Lord. Saturday aside, surely it's true. Since when it's impossible, ever stop to you. The Friday's disappointment, the Sunday's empty too. Since when is impossible 
us, Lord, we continue to sing your praise. We dwell on your faithfulness, God, for you are with us, Lord. Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake winds and
can go ahead and have a seat. So awesome, we serve a God that's done so much for us, dying on the cross, providing for us on a daily basis. Everything we good in our life comes from Him. Right now, we're going to take a minute to worship Him through giving back. Uh, we're going to do that by going to campcc.net. You can click give at the top of the page, or you can text any amount you want to donate to 84321. Alternatively, if you'd rather write a check or use cash, we have an offering box in the lobby, or you can mail it in to the church if you're at home. Uh, this is one of the ways we worship God. It's just we say, God, you're number one in all things, and we trust in you. And we thank you and acknowledge all the good you've done in, in our lives and all that you've provided us. Um, you know, or also I want to bring your attention the initiative we're doing this month. It's called the Hope Project. If you're here with us live, you probably saw a card on the seat when you came in. If you're online, I encourage you to check out after the service. Go to our website and click on our current events page. Um, there's uh, we're doing this initiative to benefit the Ventura County Pregnancy Center that helps uh, young uh, pregnant moms, and we're doing it by collecting onesies, car seats. Um, money for pregnancy tests and money for Bibles. And if you want to participate with that, I just encourage you to check it out all month long. We're going to be featuring them. Um, let me pray. Lord, thank you for being with us in the room today. Thank you for being in our lives, for your salvation, for dying on the cross for us, for all the provision in our life, all the good things, Lord. We have so much to be thankful and grateful for, Lord, and we just praise you here in this room today. Lord, we utilize these gifts that are received to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. How's everybody doing? Welcome to Camarillo Community Church. My name is David Hurtado. Whether you're on, online or outside or in the building, so glad you are here. I'm so excited. Uh, so many things I'm excited about. One is how you guys have jumped on with us uh, through Project Hope, uh, where we're teaming up with uh, Ventura a Pregnancy Center. And uh, I'll just tell you a quick story real quick because I can't help it. Uh, and there's like 20 car seats out there. I, I was thinking maybe you guys would get a couple, you know what I mean, and get onesies because those are cheap and car seats are expensive. We have so many of them. And... And uh, the lady who's helping us, you know, kind of the person in between the two groups is saying, hey, we need a car seat right now. We ran out, and there's this family that just finished their videos, and they need a car seat right now. Can I take one? I'm like, yeah, take it. Take the car seat. And so, and here we have like 20 more that are coming their direction uh, to help out in this situation where families find themselves maybe in a bit of crisis. I wasn't expecting to get pregnant, those type of situations. And this uh, team comes out, gives them a Bible, gives them the gospel, and gives them tools on, on, on parenting uh, at the same time and kind of really develops a relationship with them for the next two years. It's not like you have a baby and they're done with them. They, they continue that relationship for two years into that child's life. So thank you for joining us. We need more onesies. Uh, we need you to go to the store and buy onesies. We need to fill up the crib with onesies. I did hear another story of a Cam, Cam CC family uh, meeting another Cam CC family at Target, buying all the onesies, and they said, Cam CC, Cam CC, yeah, okay, good. And they bought all the onesies that were available at uh, Target. So continue to do that with us. You still have time. There's still time to be involved. We're going to be doing this through the month of November. And so uh, be, feel, feel, feel free to jump on. One more thing, and then we'll jump into the message, and that is this. Uh, you know, cases are rising, COVID, all that's going on right now. Uh, our elder team has decided together that we want to stay within the spirit of the guidelines that are set before us. And so what we're going to be doing in the next couple weeks is we're going to be uh, shifting to two gathering times. We'll do uh, a 9 o'clock and a 1045. We'll start that in December. So in the month of December, uh, we will have more space in the sense that we can spread out a little more, and I'll need half of you guys to switch to 1045. Right now, I'm asking you to pray about it and think about it. And in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to ask for some commitments. Uh, I can do that for three months type of thing, all right? And, and just in the spirit of trying to spread us out a little thinner uh, during this season, and then one day, I'm sure uh, God will have it to where we can come back to everything's normal again in the future. And so that's what we're going to be doing. So be aware of that in December, two gathering times so that we can spread out a little more. Now, let's jump into today and the message. Now, I don't know if you noticed, um, but uh, the Supreme Court has been at the center, at the front center, uh, of American news in the last several years. Have you noticed that? 
Uh, whether it's religious communities fighting for religious uh, protections or, or the rights of the unborn, or whether it's the LGBT plus community fighting for equal rights, it seems the su Supreme Court uh, seems to be at the center of those discussions. Most recently, you know that uh, Justice Ruth Gader Bader Ginsburg passed away and her seat was filled. This is huge uh, because she, uh, for years, had a reputation of, as being an advocate for gender equality and, and women's rights, bringing long overdue attention to the plight of women in society that had devalued them and even had a history of underpaying them. Unfortunately, that still goes on today some. She also was a huge proponent of uh, women's right to choose. In her mind, um, it was imperative for a woman to have this choice if she's ever going to be considered equal to a man. She must be in control of that decision. Now, this is difficult for many Christ followers, uh, hard for us to swallow, because in our worldview, we believe God makes the decisions there. He's the decision maker. You know, there's another um, Supreme Court justice who passed away in the last four years as well. His name was Justice Antonin Scalia. You ever heard of him? He was kind of polar opposite of RGB on almost every matter related to the law. She was pro-choice, he was pro-life. He was an originalist. She believed that the Constitution should be an evolving contemporary, contemporary document that needs to be evolving in its interpretation because we the people mean something different today than it did when it was originally written. She was a Jew, he was a Roman Catholic. And they were on opposites, they were opposites on everything from religious backgrounds to litigious thoughts, a personal demeanor. It might surprise you to know that they were great friends. In fact, they might even be considered best friends. Uh, they famously would go to the opera together. She loved the opera, he loved the opera, they'd go together. Their families would celebrate New Year's together every year. A tradition established in the 1980s, they continued, they would dress up and turn, the new, turn, the, turn in the New Year together. They traveled together, famously riding on the same elephant in India. There's a picture of them on an elephant, on an elephant ride in India. They even enjoyed shopping together. They were great friends. When it was announced that Justice Ginsburg's husband had died, Justice Scalia cried on the bench. When asked about their friendship, Justice Scalia said, what is there not to like about her except her views on the law? <laughs> when asked about their friendship, Justice Ginsburg quoted Scalia saying, I attack ideas, I don't attack people, some very good people have some very bad ideas. They were great friends, best of friends. Families would get together often. And I share this because it's kind of important in the sense of our topic today. You see, in our culture today, we've lost that whole idea that you can have a different worldview and yet still be agreeable with each other. I disagree with your view, but I agree with you. That even though we're on polar opposites and worldview-wise, we can agreeably disagree. Something we're not used to seeing anymore. In fact, if you don't agree with me, I will counsel you out. And I wonder if there's an alternative where you can hold opposing worldviews in a loving way. Is that possible? You see, today we're gonna talk about the polarizing topic of homosexuality. I say polarizing because sometimes we get backed into a false dichotomy as it relates to this issue. You are considered intolerant if your religion tells you something or tells you that homosexuality is wrong, then you and your religion are bigoted because you promote hate against homosexuals. And I think to myself, man, I don't want to promote hate against anybody. Or you can be tolerant. The only way you can show love and compassion to gay people is to recognize their homosexuality as morally acceptable. But what if I can't do that religiously? What if that's against my worldview? You see, the Christian worldview, we believe that everybody is within their God-given autonomy to believe whatever they want. We don't force anyone into believing anything. But the way our culture is going today we don't seem to be afforded that same right. 
I wonder if there's a third option. One where we can lovingly embrace the truth of the scriptures, but yet without bigotry. Where we can lovingly embrace the truth of the scriptures, but without any bigotry. See, the effort today is to look at the scriptures and to come to a biblical understanding of a post-moral culture. How do we biblically understand post-moralism in our culture? I say post-moral because we've moved on from moralism. We're, we're, no, we're no longer moral. We don't even know what the definition of moralism is. Or what, what is morality? It's used so flippantly today on things that have nothing to do with morals. If you describe morality as what is written in the Bible, what is right and wrong in the Bible, that God gets to decide what is moral and what is immoral, our culture has quickly moved away from that. I don't even know what the Bible says anymore. I don't even know the Bible's guidelines and expectations, and I certainly don't use that as my indicator to figure out what is moral and what is immoral. And so we'll ask the question today, how does the Bible describe our culture's moral plight? And what is the Bible's solution to it? How did we find ourselves in this place that we currently find ourselves in, and is there a spiritual solution? How do our scriptures describe the state of our current affairs And what is the biblical solution? So for that, I'd love you to turn your Bible right now. Open your bound Bible to Romans chapter 1. Or if you have your phone with you, open to Romans chapter 1. We're going to be hanging out in Romans chapter 1 today. And the overarching question you'll see on the screen says this. How is the church, that's the church universal, we've talked about this before. How is the church universal to respond to a post-moral culture? A culture that has left morality, a culture that doesn't believe in the morality of the Bible anymore. How is the church to respond to that culture? What is are we to do in the midst of a culture that is moving away quickly and becoming very post-moral? First thing we need to do is we need to understand the origin of the problem. Uh, you, can't, you can't necessarily know a solution to the problem until you know the origin of the problem. That's what we're going to look at first, the origin of the problem, uh, starting at verse 18 in Romans chapter 1. I'm just going to read it for what it says, and then we'll talk about it. It says this. Uh, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's an underlying highlight circle kind of a moment there. If you have your Bible with you. Uh, Underlying highlight circle there. Uh, Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that he's made. So they, are with, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give, him, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of of the immortal God for images that resemble mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They, they, They came up with their own counterfeit gods, is the idea there. Therefore, God gave them up in their lust of their hearts to impurity and to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to this honorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debased mind and to whatever they ought not to do or to be done. How is the church to respond to a post-moral culture? Number one, understand that the origin where the origin of the problem comes from. It says the origin of the problem comes from this idea that humanity suppresses the truth. It's the idea to push something down. It's the idea to restrain. I will not, buy, I'm gonna push that away. I will not allow myself to, to, to embrace that. I reject it, I push it away, I press down, I suppress the truth. It's the idea of refusing to bow to what I know it's true. I know this is true, but I'm gonna push against it anyway. And by the way, he's describing all of humanity here. 
Everyone, everybody who's ever lived is suppressing the truth that they don't come to God. I know this is true, but I'm gonna push away. There's a wall right here. I'm gonna push away from it. Restrain it. Get it away from me. I will not allow myself to believe that which I know is true. You say, well, I don't believe the Bible, so I, I don't even believe in this whole God thing anyway. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You don't need to believe in the Bible, according to what he said here, because just going outside and taking in natural revelation or general revelation, what we call it, when I go outside and I see the clouds and the sky and the sun and trees that make air and air, water, and all these things that have to work together so life can be possible on Earth. We're trying to find life on other planets, but we don't have the same conditions to where there can be life so far that we can see. Uh, all these things come together and make it happen so it's possible. Just looking outside and seeing it, all working together. If we get too close to the sun, we burn up. If we get too far away from the sun, we freeze. And yet we've been here for centuries in existence. How does all that work together? Planets don't fly into each other. And the vastness of galaxy upon galaxy upon galaxy. How is all this here, natural and general revelation? Scream out, there must be someone who created this thing. It just can't come from nothing. Someone's got to be behind this whole thing. Screams out. And so he says, because you've been able to walk outside and just see and look around and see there must be a creator, there must be a God, you are left without an excuse. We've all done this before, before we knew Christ, suppress the truth. I don't, I don't want God, get it away. I do not, if I, if I give in to the concept of God, then I've got to follow him. And I don't want to do that because I'm God. I like that I get to be the one who makes the decisions. And all of us have dealt with this. And finally, in Romans chapter one, it says, because they suppress the truth, God has handed them over to their impurity. And then he gives us three signs of a culture going post-moral. Number one, wisdom is viewed as foolish. They exchange truth for a lie. Number two, God is substituted out. They exchange the creator for the created, copycat images of God. Mother Earth, whatever you want to, several different ones. Or I'm God, I get to decide. And number three, sexual morality is up for grabs. Natural relations are exchanged for unnatural ones. Specifically in the text, talking about homosexuality, but it, it's not just homosexuality, it's all kinds of sexual immorality. Which, by the way, in this series, we've talked about extramarital affairs, we've talked about Fornication, that's any sex outside of marriage. Cohabitation, we've talked about divorce. We've talked about the immorality of all these things. So don't, don't pigeon me, don't pigeonhole me. He's a, he's a one, one issue warrior here. No, no, no. If you've been here for the whole series, we've dealt with all the immoralities. And they're all wrapped in together. A, a, a people that say, I'm pushing away God, and so therefore God gives us over into our impurity, and this is what you see, you find a post-moral culture. So, why do we have to be so clear about this? Why do we need to like be so open and clear about our stance at the risk of sounding bigoted? Why would you do that? Believe me, I'm worried about the same thing. I don't want to come across as a bigoted pastor or a bigoted church. I don't want none of that. But why is it so important to be clear? I'll tell you why it's important. There's a website called churchclarity.com. You can go check it out today if you want to. Uh, they list churches as affirming or non-affirming as it relates to LGBT plus stances. And so are, do they affirm that LGBT plus uh, morality is, is okay in God's eyes, or are they a non-affirming of that? And so you get ranked. This church is affirming. This church is non-affirming. All right? So uh, we would be a very loving, non-affirming church. I mean, we do not affirm that, that to live in a homosexual lifestyle is glorifying God, or that that's within God's standard, or that it's moral. We would say, no, it's immoral. Okay? There are other churches that are now affirming that and saying, we affirm. Hey, you don't have to change anything about yourself. Nothing. Nope, nope. You're within the glory. You're glorifying God in your life. And so there are websites now that rank you affirming or non-affirming, but even a step further than that, they rank you as clear or unclear. Are they affirming and clear? 
Or are they non-affirming and not clear? What are they? And so it can be like this. Listen, this church here is a non-affirming church, but they're not clear about it. So you come in and you enjoy, you feel like you're part of the church, you invest two years of your life, and then you end up in a, in a membership class, and they go, oh, sorry, you can't become a member, or you can't serve here, because we don't approve of your lifestyle. We find it to be against the Bible. And then you have these couples and these families going, wait a second, I just spent three years of my life investing in this church, and now I finally find out where they stand on this stuff. And it's like a bait and switch thing that happens, and they go, wait, I would have I just appreciate it if you would have told me at the beginning before I started falling in with all these people and then realized you guys are all against me. And so it becomes very important that you become very clear exactly where you stand. It's very important that you're lovingly clear so there's not a bait and switch that goes on. And by the way, we're not against anyone, but we are for upholding the Bible in every area whether people like what it says or don't. You may be here today and you don't struggle with this one issue, but you struggle with many others. And there are many times where we preach it and you go, oh, there I am. We're gonna uphold this thing, no matter which way culture goes. Well, speaking of affirming uh, churches and affirming denominations and whatnot, how do they deal with this passage? If you, if you are affirming that homosexual lifestyle is not immoral before God, you believe it's plenty moral, it's fine, then what do they do with Romans chapter 1? How do they get out of what it seems to say? This is kind of interesting. Um, some arguments that they will use are this, that it's not a homosexual issue, it's a prostitution issue. The issue that Paul's dealing with is that they were going to, prostitution, to, to prostitutes they were having same-sex relations with prostitutes, and that's the issue, not homosexuality itself, but the prostitution was a problem. Another argument would be, uh, this wasn't uh, same-sex monogamous loving relationships for a long period of time within the boundaries of even legalized marriage. This was excessive lust. So they were being promiscuous. It's not homosexuality is not the issue, but they're, they're sleeping with every other person. And that's the issue. The third argument would be, uh, it's not, homosexuality is not the issue here, but pedophilia is the issue. And this is actually the most compelling one out of all three of them, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, pedophilia is the issue here, not homosexuality. It's an older man and a younger boy that is at mind here, and that's why what Paul is saying is more about pedophilia than it is about homosexuality. Now, let me describe the first century for you because this is really important. Paul's writing a letter to the church in, in, in Rome. Uh, it's a Roman church, and so let me tell you about Roman culture at the time of his writing. All right, this is really important. Uh, it would be very customary if I was a Roman person, a Roman man within the, uh, uh, the first century to have a wife and have children that would legitimize my line, legitimize my name, legitimize myself through, throughout society. But additionally to that, it would be very customary for me also to have an additional sexual partner, a young, effeminate boy. And that was there to fulfill my sexual passion. So here, here's the idea. In the first century, men had their wives and children to legitimize their family, legitimize themselves within society. They also had this young, effeminate boy that they would uh, fulfill their sexual passion with over here. Very customary within the first century of Rome. That is true. You can find that culturally, historically, you'll be able to find that. That was the norm of the day. The only thing that would be abnormal is if that same man said, you know what, I'm going to push myself on a boy who's not effeminate. If you want to read more on this, you can uh, um, take up uh, Preston Sprinkles, A People to be Loved. He goes into this in depth. And so uh, that would be you forcing yourself on a person. That's rape. And so you can't, can't if, the, if the boy's effeminate, it's okay. If the boy's not effeminate, then it's not okay. And so they take that cultural, true cultural, historical setting of the first century of Rome and say, say see, that's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1. It's pedophilia. It's not homosexuality. There's only one problem with that. It's not what the text says. We can take these arguments from culture and from, from custom and, and history and, and we can implant, implant them on the scriptures, but it's not what the text says. It's a hermeneutical issue. Hermeneutics is the idea of how you study the Bible, how you derive truth from the word of God. The simplest way, I used to teach it to middle schoolers all the time. When I was in fifth grade, I wrote a note to Mariana Donna. I like you, do you like me back? Checks box, yes, checks box, no. She put checks box, no. She lived to regret it the rest of her life. If you found her on Facebook, she would tell you today she regrets it. 
I'm not allowed to take that note back and say, I think she likes me. Why? Because authorial intent matters. Because words have meaning and they matter. And so I take the note and I read it for what it says. She doesn't like me. Big mistake. I hope she has butt ugly kids. No, I'm just kidding. The word of God says they exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. That's what it says. That's what it says. And the words matter. By the way, it wasn't only men exchanging natural relations for unnatural ones. It was women as well, according to Romans 1. And while there is historically and culturally, contextually, an argument that can be made that it was Older man, young boy, power dynamic, me too movement kind of thing, wrong, pedophilia. There was not the same thing in regards to women. We're not going to be able to go back in history and culture and find that there were women who were also targeting young women in that relationship. It's not the same context. And he's saying, just like men gave up relations with women for other men, women gave up relations with men for other women as well. What he's talking about is natural relations exchanged for unnatural ones. Hermeneutically speaking, please hear me as a pastor. Hermeneutically speaking, if anybody anybody ever comes to you and says, here's what the Bible says, but this piece of history and culture negates what the Bible says, you should have a light bulb come on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't give me any history or culture that negates what the word of God says. Now, if you have culture and history that advances what the word of God is saying, that's one thing. Okay, great. That helps me understand the Bible. But if you're giving me history and culture and it's actually negating, you're telling me why the Bible doesn't say what it says, your mind should go, wait a second. And by the way, we're going to deal with this again in a couple weeks when we deal with another issue where that exact same hermeneutic comes in. Well, this is the culture, and so that's why the Bible's wrong. No, no, no. The Bible says what it says. Checks box yes, checks box no. Authorial intent matters and words matter. So remember that in your mind in a couple of weeks when we come back to that again. Anytime somebody comes to you with a cultural or, or historical argument to negate the word of God, something in your mind say that's problematic. But the issue that we're seeing in our text today is culture Humanity suppresses the truth and then God hands us over to our impurity. Not just homosexuality, let's remember divorce, affairs, fornication, pornography, we've talked about all those things in this series. Well, let's talk about some solutions to the post-moral culture. What are some solutions? How uh, is the church to respond to a post-moral culture? Number one, uh, we are to understand the origin of the problem. We suppress the truth. God hands us over. That's the origin of the problem. Number two, understand there's a solution to that problem. Understand that there's a solution to that problem. Now, I did something dirty here. I actually re- had you read, or we read together, verses 18 through 28 together, but I skipped verses 16 and 17. I did that on purpose. Uh, and, and, and it's really the, the basis of everything Paul's saying. He introduces himself to the church. I'm writing you guys. I love you guys. And then he says, verse 16 and 17, that's kind of like the foundation. And then he starts describing culture and how it's gone immoral. And I want to go back now and read verses 16 and 17 and see what he says, almost like he sets up the solution first. Hey, guys, I know the plight really bad right now. I know it looks really bad out there. Let me tell you the solution before we even get to the problem because I don't want you to be down or discouraged about what's going on here. And let's look at verse 16 and 17 and see what it says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the what? Power. Power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, I want to tell you right at the outset, I know you're living in, in Rome, and you could say this about Corinth as well, and everything's going sideways sexually and immoral. All these things are going wrong. But I, I want to let you know before we get started on that stuff, I am so confident in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm so confident. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. There's a solution before before you get all disappointed about the problem, understand there's a solution. There is a big solution there that makes me confident enough to speak about this problem because there's a solution behind it. 
He actually, before he gets to that, he's like, I'm sorry I didn't get to visit you sooner. I'm so excited to come and preach the gospel to you in person. I don't care if you're Greek. I don't care if you're Jewish. There's no partiality with God. The gospel reaches everyone. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your orientation is, none of that. I have no partiality. I'm so excited to preach the gospel and see what happens. Why am I so excited to preach the gospel? Because no matter how far our culture spirals out, the gospel still has the power to save. Understand the solution. The gospel is the solution. No, no culture, completely spiraled out or not, would stop him from being confident in God's power and strength to correct any immorality that's out there. I believe we have a solution, that's what he's saying, to whatever, however far culture spirals out. See, what happens is humanity thinks they got it all figured out, and then they think they're wise in their own mind, and the Spirit of God breaks through into the heart by means of the gospel, and then you realize that you've been given to foolishness all this time. That's what happens. In fact, it happens to all of us. And even in the room is a believer in Jesus Christ. Yeah, that was me. Thought I had it all figured out, and the gospel hit me. Oh, my gosh, I've been living foolishness all this time. And, and then there's this transformation that happens. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect and I get everything right, so I make big, huge mistakes, but... God is working inside of me and changing me from the inside out. It happens to all of us. It's the power of the gospel, and it happens internally. It happens inside, not outside. In fact, our big idea beyond the screen says this. God changes us from the inside out, not from the outside in. God changes us from the inside out and not from the outside in. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your life experience is. I don't care how much money you've made. I don't care how much the amount of fame that you've been able to establish for yourself in your life. I don't care what your sexual orientation is. No one is excluded. Everyone is a candidate to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, we've talked about affairs and divorce and pornography and fornication, cohabitation, all of them in this series. No one is excluded. Everybody is a candidate. If you're messed up, you are a candidate for God. Isn't that beautiful? He saves and he transforms. In the midst of the transformation, we become countercultural. That's what the whole series has been about. But understand this. God changes us from the inside out, not from the outside in. I never expect somebody to come in the door. It's the first day and have it all figured out. Never. You're visiting us, and you're like, man, I don't measure up. Great, you're in a great place to be, because none of us measured up. We all figured out that we needed Jesus, and that's when he began the transformation process. Somebody should say amen to that. Never expect them to have it figured out on the first day they come through the doors. The gospel has to win them over first. You catch the fish before you clean them. It'd be completely ridiculous to try to clean fish that aren't caught yet. God changes us from the inside out, not from the outside in. So now let's put some rubber to the road here. How does this affect us as a church? Let me see if I can relate this in a tangible way. Uh, you guys know that I came from Arizona. I actually grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, then went to Arizona for four years before I got my assignment to come here to be the lead pastor here. Uh, there for many years, about four years, my wife and I had this thing. We married 18 some odd years, and so we would do this thing where we'd make cookies and invite people to church because we're all around you guys all the time, and all you guys know Jesus, so how do we meet somebody who doesn't know Jesus so we can have an impact in their life? Well, obviously, around church people is not going to help, so we would just walk to our neighbors, and we had this like we did it a couple times over the last 18 years. Make cookies, Christmas time, want to come to church? Make cookies. Uh, hey, you have somewhere to go to for Easter? And so this particular time, we had uh, bought this house in Arizona across the street with the coolest neighbors in the whole street. We loved them. They were awesome. They were like our favorite neighbors. And we're like, let's invite them. So we put cookies on a platter, and we walked on over and knocked on the door and said, hey, uh, I, 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 we don't know if you, you know, uh, if, if you have a place to go, if you call, have a church you call home, uh, you know, but if you don't, we'd love to invite you to our church to celebrate Easter with us. Easter's coming up. I don't know if you're, if you're into that kind of thing, but we'd love to celebrate uh, Easter with you, and you could come with us. The gal standing at the door looked at us, and, and uh, uh, you could tell she was getting kind of taken back for a moment. She had almost like a tear in her eye. And she kind of just, in a very soft tone, said, wow, thank you. You know, when I was a little girl, I used to go to church. In fact, I used to go to Nawana program. We have Awanas here. And I remember learning those Bible verses. And we'd go and recite the Bible verses and we'd play. Just teared up. 
And she looked back up at us and she said, but would my partner be welcome as well? And we had some suspicions, but you never, you're never gonna, you know, assume anything, so roommates, partner, we don't know. There's no question about the vulnerability that she was displaying right in front of us. We knew exactly what she was saying. My roommate's also my partner. Would we still be welcome if you knew the truth about us? I think that's a great question. How would you handle that? Maybe you go, oh, well, if that's the case, let me take the cookies back. Hopefully you wouldn't do that. What would you say? And right now, whatever you're deliberating your mind and thinking through and all these different jumps, the, you, you know, hoops to jump through, all these things, believe me, that's what I'm thinking too, how, how, you know, and my wife just springs into action. I mean, it's like my, my, one of my most proudest moments, moments in the world, my wife, she just goes, boom, you better believe you're welcome. You come sit by me, and if anybody gives you the stink eye, you let us know. My husband's the executive pastor, and we'll deal with them. <laughs> and then she said, you know, we all come to church, and we, we place ourselves underneath the Bible. And all of us at some point or another feel challenged by this thing. And so that's true for whoever you are, whoever it is that comes. But as for being welcome, yes, you're welcome. Come sit by me. I want to ask you a question, church. Is that true? those gals be welcome at our church? Would you make them feel welcome? How about we make a deal right now, me and you? I'll keep preaching the truth in love, and you keep welcoming everybody who walks through the doors. No matter what their background is, no matter what their race is, no matter what their socioeconomic status, no matter what their history is, no matter where they've been, what they've been through, they just came out of jail, no matter what. You welcome them, and I'll preach the truth. Because the the gospel changes people from the inside out, not the outside in. We need them in the room so they can hear the message and let, let, let God do what he does. And it's beautiful to see that happening. I want to spend a couple minutes here just on a couple things. Pastor, what do I do with these same sex attraction issues that I have, these same sex desires that I have? I don't want them. What do I do with them? I, I can't get rid of them. I, I, I wish I could get rid of them. They're stuck inside of me. What do I do? If you're in that situation, I would just tell you that no matter what situation you find yourself in life, I don't care what orientation you are or what, what life has brought on the scene for you, there's always a way to glorify God, and that's your true north. Remember that. It's your purpose for life. How do I glorify God in this situation? Every one of us has to go through it. No matter if you have a a new medical diagnosis, you have to find out how can you glorify God. And so your job is to say, how do I glorify God in the midst of this situation? I wish I could tell you the desires would leave you, that you could pray it away. But that doesn't always happen. God is powerful enough to do that, but it doesn't always happen. So I'm not going to promise you that they'll go away. The Apostle Paul had this amazing ability. He would walk and his shadow would touch somebody and heal them, according to the book of Acts. He would walk and his shadow, he didn't say a word, his shadow touches the person and heals them. But then when it came time to heal himself, I have this thorn in the flesh. A lot of people think he was blind or he's going blind. That's why he writes stuff like, I write this with my own hand or I write this in large letters. What's wrong with his eyes? Why does he always have to have a scribe write for him? And when he, when he, when he comes, it's time for me to heal myself. God, would you take this thorn away from me? Will you take the thorn in the flesh away from me? Three times I asked, and three times God said no. In the process, he would learn that God was sufficient. Sometimes God says no. And I wish I could tell you you could pray it away. I'm not sure that you can. I'm not sure that God's purpose in that will be for that to go away from you. It may be that you would be a living model that God is sufficient, his grace is sufficient for you. 
Pastor, what do I do then? There's some, some people with same-sex attraction who remain single. By the way, it's not a subordinate in life. See our message two or three weeks ago. Ask Jesus Christ if the single life is a subordinate life. Did he live a subpar life? Ask Paul the apostle if singleness is a subpar life. Some who have same-sex attraction remain single. In fact, there's a book called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel by Christopher Yon. He's a professor at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. He was, uh, uh, before coming to Christ, uh, living in a homosexual lifestyle. And he's since decided to be single. It does a great book if you're wanting to know more. It goes in depth with the scriptures and tells you about his life, about how he's decided to remain celibate in his quest to glorify God with his life. There are others who say, you know what, I have great friends, more than one, great friends who are followers of Jesus Christ who have gotten married and raised families even with this in the background. Don't know that God's calling you to that, but that's a possibility as well. You can glorify God like that. Whatever you do, you must find how you can glorify the God the most. How you can glorify him the most. And lastly, I would say, maybe you're here today and you're struggling with post-moral struggles and you think, God doesn't want me. So clearly, I'm on the hit list of who God hates. I can't possibly be a candidate for the gospel. I want to erase that from your mind. You are. Just the very fact that you can recognize that God's up here and I'm down here. You're already ahead of 90% of people in America. I don't deserve this, God. You're right, neither do I. That's why we come by faith to Jesus Christ. We believe that he lived the perfect life that I could never live, and he takes my sin, dies on the cross, and then replaces it in a great exchange. I'm gonna give you righteousness as if you lived a life that you didn't live. And then God would look at me and say, even though I know everything you've done, past, present, and future, all the things that are ungodly and immoral in your life, I know them, but I'm putting them aside. And I'm pardoning them, I'm forgiving them because I'm giving you credit for the life of Jesus Christ. If you're struggling with post-moral sexuality, that is a great, great story for you. God wants to forgive. God wants to save. And God wants to transform. It's available to you. And the enemy would like to convince you that God hates you, but he doesn't. In fact, you're the very reason he sent his son. Why don't we bow our heads and pray together? Father, desire a church where we have enough grace and mercy and compassion for anyone and anywhere, no matter what they're struggling with, no matter where their desires have taken them in the past. If they desire to live according to the will of God, I, I, I want to give God a chance. I want to live and glorify God with my life. I have these struggles. I have these, these tendencies, whatever it may be. I've done bad things. No matter what it is, if I just want to glorify God, that we would meet him right there. And we say, we'd be a brother with you. We'd be a sister to you. And we will walk with you through the highs and lows. And when you're single and you get the promotion and there's nobody there to celebrate with you because you don't have a husband or a wife to go home and celebrate and go have dinner, we'll step in and we'll go with you and we'll take you out to Wood Ranch and we'll celebrate you, we'll fill the void, we'll be your family. As you strive to honor God in your life, we will be there with you. And no matter how far you've come from and no matter the ugliest things, if you knew, Pastor, if you knew the ugliest things about me, you wouldn't even talk to me. It's not true. Jesus Christ himself would find the lowliest of the low. It's a prostitute cleaning my feet right now, and, and it's beautiful. I love her. And the religious folk go, why are you standing around her? Why would you allow her to touch her feet? You're becoming impure by, by the mere touch of her hands or your feet. She cleans your feet with her hair. I do it because she's my daughter. I do it because I have the mercy and compassion to love her. I do it because she's repentant. I do it because she recognizes that she's not able to get there on her own. And those are the people I came for. Father, all of us, no matter what we feel our orientation is or, or what we feel like we struggle, uh, well, they struggle with this and I struggle with that. We all don't measure up to you. That's why we need the gospel. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So clear, you're higher, we're lower. We need you to help us get up 
It's where we can be in your presence. And we all get there the same way by the work of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. There's a pardon for sin if you placed your faith in Jesus. I can't make it on my own, I gotta acknowledge that. But once I put my faith in Jesus, God says, you've been pardoned. You have forgiveness. Now becomes the journey to glorify God with your life. That's true for me, and it's true for everybody in the room, and it's true for everybody outside in the community who rejects Jesus Christ. It's true for all, and we want to preach it. We want to see it. We want to see you move. We want to see people from every walk of life in this room with their hands in the air, worshiping a God. This is too good that he'd save me. This is too good. We pray for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me for the send-off? You know, I love our church. The word church is going to hold the Bible up high. We're going to preach what the Bible says, even when it goes against popular opinion, even when it goes against the culture, and it's difficult. But at the same time, I love that our church is going to be welcoming and loving. You know, I, I firmly believe that people don't come here by accident. They come here by the sovereign will of God. I mean, I also believe that as Christians, when we're out in the world, the people in our, that we bump into, God's bringing those people to us. And then you're never going to bump into anyone who doesn't have a soul. You're never going to lock eyes with anyone who Christ didn't die for. No matter how depraved or what sins they're in or whether they're drug addicts or criminals or whatever it is, um, Christ died for those people. And he, we have a mission to reach them with the gospel. If you're here today and you said yes to Jesus, would you let us know? You can do that online or tell someone on your way out in the lobby. But anyways, that concludes our service. Thanks for coming today. We'll see you next week.